my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Motif Medical. Motif designs insurance eligible products for busy moms. With a focus on innovation and empowerment, Motif's line of breast pumps and maternity compression garments are sophisticated yet discreet and made to support mothers as they navigate new motherhood. Discover why moms are reporting more milk in less time with the Luna breast pump and see how you can get it covered through insurance at motifmedical.com slash birth hour. Long time listeners know how much I personally loved using the Luna breast pump and I've heard from so many of you that you've loved it as well, which is why I'm especially excited about Motif's new wearable pump, the Aura. And at the end of today's episode, I talk with their lactation consultant, Ashley, all about what makes this a unique wearable pump. So stay tuned for that conversation. Before we get to today's birth story, I want to talk a little bit about our online childbirth course. It's called Know Your Options, and this is the course you've been looking for if you just have that gut feeling that you know you should be taking a childbirth course, but maybe the one that's being offered to you by your care provider is not exactly what you're looking for. It might be more catered towards the type of birth they want you to have versus making you informed of all your different options and how to address different things that happen in birth, because as this podcast has shown us, birth is very unpredictable. So we would love to have you check out our 12 module course. You can go to the birthhour.com slash course to see detailed outlines of what is included in the course. You will also get a bonus course called beyond the first latch. That is an additional six modules all about pumping, feeding your baby, going back to paid work. If that's part of your plan. And we have a special coupon code for you. It's one zero zero OFF for $100 off enrollment. Again, that's the birthhour.com slash course. All right, we have another rebroadcast for you today. I am still very much under the weather, getting some additional tests done and things like that. Hopefully feeling better soon, but just spending about 95% of the day in bed at this point. So this episode first aired in 2017. It's from our archives. If you want to access our archives, you can always do that by becoming a Patreon member at patreon.com slash birth hour. We have hundreds of episodes there that are not in the main podcast feed, and this is one of them. All right, let's get to today's episode. Today's birth story guest is Kate, who discovered at 38 weeks that her baby was breech and made the decision to have an ECV done to turn the baby and went on to have a successful home birth. Hi, Kate. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Can you start off by giving listeners just a little bit of background on you and your family? So I am a wife to my husband and a mom to a five-year-old girl. We had a home birth. Something that makes our story kind of interesting is the fact that I am a labor and delivery nurse. Um, So I... I've been an L&D nurse for t- almost 10 years now. Well, actually, in March, it'll be 10 years. So I had been working as a nurse for several years before I gave birth to our daughter. The other part of my background is that um, before I was a nurse, I was a birth doula. Um, I worked as a birth doula in New York City, and I worked primarily with a home birth midwife. So home birth was kind of my beginning, and then I transitioned into work as an L&D nurse. But it was a very interesting experience to confront pregnancy and to be working full time as a nurse and to be going through, you know, the realities of my work as a nurse and to kind of walk a path of like trying to be a mommy too and like a mama and to trust my body and to trust the pregnancy and to take good care of myself Um, and to have as physiologic a birth as I could. That's awesome. I don't know that we've had this perspective on before. I'm really excited to to hear your story about kind of being an L&D nurse and choosing home birth. I think it's important for all of us to hear each other's stories. And I think that is a huge thing that I like to do 
um, in my work as a nurse and a doula and someone that hears women and tries to listen to women. I think that there are, um, like, especially during pregnancy, everyone's like, well, what category are you in? Like, what, <laughs> like, what kind of pregnancy are you planning? Are you, you know, what kind of birth are you planning? Are you unmedicated or are you going to have an epidural? Are you going to have like an OB and, you know, every machine and whistle and ping and everything for your birth and as quick and easy as possible, or are you going to just let birth unfold? So I think that there are a lot of times when we talk to people about our experiences, they kind of try to categorize what we are and where we fall. And I think that that really sells, sells us short because I think that we can be all of the things or, you know, a blend of any of those options. And as the pregnancy unfolds, something I learned was that I needed a whole different combination of things in order to have the best birth that I could have. And I'm grateful for all parts of it. I'm grateful for my home birth. I'm grateful for all of the reading that I did. I'm grateful for other women whose births I had attended before. And I'm also grateful that I had access to medical care when I needed it during the pregnancy. Yeah. Well, let's get into it then. So why don't you talk about finding out you were pregnant and what your kind of initial thoughts were about the type of birth that you wanted? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to be, I'm going to be really honest here because, um, I think that truth is a medicine in and of itself. And so I'm, it's a little scary to tell the full truth and kind of unedited or unsweetened version, but I trust that that's what y'all need me to say. And that's what you're, you want to hear. So I, I was working as a travel nurse on the Navajo reservation in Arizona in a very small rural hospital. Um, and I happened to meet this very handsome man hiking in a canyon. And I just immediately felt connected to him. And that ended up being my husband. But we fell in love really quickly. And kind of I knew right away that I loved him and that I wanted to be with him. And it was kind of like out of my control in a certain way. Like at that moment, it just kind of, it was like I got swept away into the ocean. Our relationship moved really quickly. And like three months in or something, a couple months in, we were sitting on the front porch and he asked me to marry him. Um, and I was like, what the fuck? Sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to swear. I, um, <laughs> but I was just like, whoa. I was like, this is like really intense for me. I don't know if I'm <laughs> ready for this. And literally six days after that, I had this really weird feeling. I was just like, something is, <laughs> something is going on. I was carving a chicken and I like, I was roasted a chicken in the oven and I was cutting into it and I was like, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. There was something about the chicken that just, I like had to like lay down on the floor <laughs> in order not to throw up while I was just like, what is going on with me? And then I noticed that my breasts were starting to feel really tender in a weird way. And I was like, oh my goodness, I think I might be pregnant. So I took a test and I took it in the bathroom and it was positive and um, my husband or my it was my fiance at the time I called him in and he was just like oh shit <laughs> so so that was how we found out we were pregnant and honestly I've never ever since I I attended my first birth as a doula at age 19 I worked with a home birth midwife for six years in New York City I worked as her assistant and provided doula support as well. I think I'm the opposite of most people because home birth is like my foundation of what birth is. That's kind of like, it's in a way, it's like how I feel like I was raised within the birth community, was within a home birth perspective. So it, to me, as soon as my husband and I talked about it, we just assumed that we would have a home birth. 
And that's not to say that it wasn't really difficult to navigate choosing a home birth as an L&D nurse. And that's something I'll talk about with y'all because that's really important. I think when we're making our birth choices as pregnant women, like we get a lot of input from people. I really feel like everything happens as it's meant to happen. And I feel like how my journey unfolded really informed the kind of support that I eventually was able to give women. So I'll explain to you how I was able to navigate that. So I was pregnant. I was a travel nurse on the Indian reservation, driving back to where my fiance lived in Flagstaff, Arizona. I mean, it was just crazy. Like my job was three hours away from where he lived and I would drive back in between, you know, stretches of working. All throughout the pregnancy, I had this idea in my mind. It's like the bird and the fish, they love each other, but where are they going to live? And I kept thinking that to myself over and over again, like, oh my gosh, like, how is this happening and why? And I, and it created a lot of ambivalence for me and a lot of worry. And I kind of just, I was like, how are we going to make this work? You know, how are we going to raise this baby? Like, how are we going to give birth to this baby and raise this baby? That was a huge part of my journey in the pregnancy. I trusted the pregnancy. Like I knew what foods to eat because I had been trained by this amazing midwife. I had that kind of wisdom. I trusted that pregnancy, like if I fed myself good food and I tried to stay as calm as I could. And I mean, it was delusional in a certain way, of course, but I was in this bubble. I tried to create a bubble around myself for like, if I took good care of the pregnancy that I trusted it would be healthy and that my baby would be healthy. And that had to be a daily practice for me. It really did because, you know, as a nurse, I witness complicated um, situations, moms that get really sick during the pregnancy and moms that get really sick and experience life-threatening um, conditions during birth. And something I learned on the Navajo reservation is that pregnant women are supposed to be protected from seeing things that kind of um, create ideas in their mind that they're not safe. So like pregnant women are not allowed to go to funerals. They're not allowed to witness death. They're kind of protected from the parts of life. Like even if someone that they love dies, they're not allowed to go to their funeral. I learned there from the women that I worked with who, you know, that was their culture that you have to protect yourself from certain things that you see and witness during pregnancy. So it was very hard for me because I couldn't really protect myself from all of that. Like I saw really scary things and a lot of, and I think that that's where people talk about the nurse curse is women who are nurses who deliver babies professionally as nurses. You know, a lot of people say, oh, there's the nurse curse. You're never going to have an easy birth. You're going to have a complicated pregnancy or you're going to have a traumatic birth or you're going to hemorrhage or something like that. So that was really what I was battling with. When I was pregnant with my first, one of my best friends was a NICU nurse. Oh, so, Lord. yeah, the <laughs> idea of worst. me having a home birth, I mean, she didn't come out and say, like, that's a terrible idea, but she was very clear that, like, she would never choose that for herself. And that, she, yes. and she kept saying, well, well, how will you, like, check their blood sugar and all these things that, yes. like, just don't come into play the same way they do in the NICU as they do, you know, yes. the healthy full term baby. So um, I can kind of relate to that on that level. Absolutely. And I have to remember that NICU nurses even see more right. than I see because they see, like, I could never do their job, honestly, because my heart is so open and tender and that's like who I am. And they see like the most catastrophic situations and healthy home birth babies don't go to NICU, you know, like healthy, mm-hmm. home, like healthy physiologic, normal births those babies don't go to the NICU. So they don't see, they don't see all of the many, many, many babies that are born healthy and without unnecessary intervention. They only see the catastrophic events. And when you are a provider and you care and you love your patients, which I mean, not all of us do, but (laughs) most of us have an insane amount of compassion for the people that we take care of. You don't want them to have something bad happen to them. That's your worst nightmare, you know, when you love someone 
you want to keep them safe. You have compassion for them. You don't want something bad to happen. So I can totally empathize with their perspective. And that is something that's a really important thing to remember. It's a perspective. It's not the truth. It's their perspective. So as a woman, that is the biggest thing that I had to grapple with when I was pregnant and during the pregnancy is what is my perspective? What is my body telling me? It was a a very beautiful journey that I had to walk to kind of figure out that I'm the only person that's been living in my body for 27 years. And I'm the only person that has the relationship with my baby where I've, I felt her move and I know what food she likes and I know what foods make me feel strong. Um, I know what makes me feel calm and grounded. Like I'm living in my body. So I am the expert of my body. I have, a, I have an early warning system that's more defined and powerful than any machine or any technology that any hospital or physician, the highest trained physician could possibly have. And that's my awareness of my body, what's, what's going on with it and of my baby. I know my baby better than anybody else does. That was kind of my mantra throughout the pregnancy is like, I know her. I know her. I trust her. Like I knew she was a girl from the moment my breast started hurting. I trusted that I knew her. I knew what she needed. And I know some people don't feel that way and that's okay too. So my husband and I, well, we got married. I was 20 weeks pregnant when we got married. We got married on the side of a mountain in Flagstaff, Arizona. And it was really beautiful. And it was a small wedding and our family was like, <laughs> like, I mean, my family, I can't even imagine what they were thinking at that time. Because first of all, I was, I went off to live on the Navajo reservation. <laughs> I met this guy like hiking in, in a canyon. I like went camping with him and fell in love with him. Three months later, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, oh, we're getting married. Oh, we're having a baby. Oh, we don't know where we're going to live. Like all of this, like I can't even imagine I have limitless empathy when someone tells me that they're pregnant and they're like, I don't know how this happened. I don't know what we're going to do. I'm like, girl, I was there too. I totally, and I am so unjudgmental of how people get pregnant. <laughs> and like, I'm in, I was like, come on, I'm a nurse. I know how the female reproductive system works. <laughs> and yes, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> I'm not here to judge at all. And I think that that was the beauty about our story. Any sort of idea about what people should do or how they should bring a baby into the world was kind of like turned upside down for us. So that was a gift, I think, in retrospect. So we, I don't know how we made this decision. It still seems crazy to me, but we decided that we would move, leave Arizona and we would move to California. And I think that the motive, like, I still don't know. This still feels like a bad decision. <laughs> but but um, we decided to move to California. And our rationale was for our little family, we really wanted somebody to stay at home with the baby in the first part of her life. So we thought that if I worked in California as a nurse, Apparently, they are supposedly make more money in California. I'm not sure if that's actually true, but we decided to move to California. So then I got a job as an L&D nurse in a huge hospital. It's the biggest hospital in California. And we kind of went from there. Um, So we had had a home birth midwife in Arizona. We had to find a new home birth midwife in California. So that was just a really interesting journey. I kind of like... I had to deal with a lot of messages I was giving myself, which is like, oh my gosh, you do not have your shit together. Like you are not ready to be a mom. Like you don't even have the same midwife your whole pregnancy. And, and like 
these people are going to think you're crazy. You're a nurse and you're having a home birth and you're switching providers and you're moving states. And so I had to like really manage, you know, as time has gone on, I've learned to talk to myself with a lot more kindness. But at the time I was being very hard on myself about my, our choices and what we were doing. And I think that that was a big struggle for me. So we found midwives in San Diego and we lived in a very small, um, it was a beach shack. It was in Ocean Beach, California. It was like, they called it a beach cottage, but actually it was a garage. (laughs) It was a garage that they had like sealed up one of the walls, like the place where the car drives in. I think they just created a wall there. So it seemed like a house, but it was actually a garage. So I was working as an L&D nurse and this was, it wasn't a crunchy hospital. It was not. I mean, it's kind of like your worst nightmare for a crunchy hippie nurse like me. It's a hospital that has like a 95% epidural rate. And I think the C-section rate is like 45% for like a low risk mom. We did continuous monitoring on everybody. If you didn't want an epidural, you had to stay in bed and not move around. Like no one knew how to deal with it. Um, So it was a really weird environment for me to be a pregnant woman planning a home birth and working as a nurse. Like I, right now I work in a hospital where people are super supportive and it's a totally different culture and environment. And we accept home birth transfers and we don't make any commentary about it. And we just show them love. And if people want to bring in a birth pool to labor in, they can. And, but this was not how, this was not the kind of hospital I worked at at the time. I had like two friends at work whose babies were due at the same time as mine planning to deliver at this hospital and they were planning on epidurals and they, you know, they handpicked their doctor that they loved and, and I just wanted to run screaming away from that situation completely. I just did not feel safe. Like I really instinctively, I knew that I just wanted to learn how to trust myself during the birth. And I wanted to learn how to listen to my body. And I had this delusional thought that it, like my birth was going to be like this transcendental <laughs> experience, which it was not for me. But I was like, I need that. I need like the pregnancy is crazy. Like I'm ambivalent about all of this. Like I feel so out of control. Like, and the only thing that I have is like this birth to kind of ground me and to give me the tools that I need. And, and listen, that was my instinct talking. That was purely my instinct. My little self knew that that's what I needed. And I encourage you, if you are sitting with your heart and your heart is like, telling you to do something in your, it it won't stop. And it just keeps telling you, you know, you you need to draw your attention over here. This is what you need. This is what you need. And even if everything all around you, all the people are telling you, no, that's not what you need. Or they're telling you, this is the way we do things. Or they're telling you babies are born this way, or you do it like this. This is the best way. You know, I would say like, your heart is so inconvenient. The messages from your heart are going to be so inconvenient. And that's what I've discovered. But but you just have to listen to it. You really do. It will keep you safe. So, okay. So I have my home birth midwives. I'm all groovy with them, whatever. I'm like, yeah, I have my home birth kit. I ordered it. Like I'm When people asked me where I was giving birth, I said, I'm giving birth at home with midwives. And they were pretty cool with me. Like, they didn't say anything horrible to me, which I've heard some people who have been through that experience have had some really rough commentary. And I really feel like the worst commentary about my home birth, our home birth plans was in my own mind. It really was. I kind of just had this whole narrative in my own mind about what everybody was thinking and judging and whatever. And I think that that was way more toxic for me than what was actually being said or whatever. So we're having our home birth visits around 36 weeks. I started having really weird thoughts that like maybe our daughter was not head down. It was just this rock hard 
like ball was in my ribs and it was so hard. I'm like, that can't be a butt. It's so hard. It's just a really round, hard ball. And I was just like, I just don't, I kept telling my midwives, I just don't think she's head down. And they're like, well, where are her hiccups? Which this, that doesn't make any sense in retrospect, but they're like, well, where is she hiccuping? And I was like, well, I feel it down here, like right by my pubic bone is where I feel the hiccups. And they're like, oh, she's definitely head down. And they kept reassuring me that she was head down, even though I was like, I was like, I don't know. It just doesn't, I don't, something's not right. And so randomly, um, there was this other nurse at work who's, who was also pregnant. Her pregnancy was earlier on, and this was totally against the rules. I'm not saying that this is a normal thing to do, but one night late at night, we were just like, Ooh, we kind of want to see inside, like see how her baby's doing and you know, they took us into a room. I was like, well, maybe you can check out my baby too and let's see what we can see. And so a friend threw the ultrasound onto my tummy. And the first thing that she saw on the screen was a pair of big, juicy lips. And that was my little girl's face. And it was way up high. She was breech, breech as breech could get. She was so breech. And I just, I like my stomach dropped and my whole self, I was just like, it was the worst panicky feeling that I've ever felt in my life. And I was, I was like, oh my gosh. And I couldn't even speak. It was like, my heart was pounding and I was sweating and I was just like, oh my gosh, I, I'm terrified. And so I went home from work that morning and I, I don't know when all of the crying happened, but I know that I spent several hours on my bathroom floor, just sobbing and just crying and crying and crying. And I just really had to process the possibility that I would not be able to have her the way that I wanted to have her, that I wouldn't be able to give birth to her at home and to listen to my body and that I potentially would maybe have to have a C-section birth with her. And for me, this just felt like a devastation. It just felt like I read into it so much more deeply than just how she was going to be born. Because for me, it was like the home birth was the only thing that was grounding me or making me feel like I had any sense of control at all. And um, I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do if I if she can't be born that way, like, I'm not going to be able to manage this. I won't be able to survive it. Like, I just didn't feel like I could emote, like I, I, it would just deplete me so much that I wouldn't be able to be as strong as I needed to be. I knew I had to be because I didn't have community and I didn't have family nearby. My husband and I had just gotten married and we were figuring everything out and And I was like, I need this. I need something to walk on. I need something to stand up on. So I was like, I just grieved and grieved and grieved and grieved and worried. And then I called, I made like a bunch of calls to all these different doctors because I didn't have a doctor. I just had two midwives. And at that time they were like, no, we are not delivering a vaginal breach at home for you. (laughs) Like we are not delivering a vaginal breach at home for you, the the L&D nurse. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, and honestly, I had a sense that that would not be the best option either. And I think I was right just because my daughter's head ended up being ginormous. So I don't know she had a wiry little body and a huge, huge head. So I think that that was a good instinct I had. So I called all these doctors and I was like, um, I was having home birth midwives, but, Um, my baby's breach and I need help. (laughs) I need, I need someone to help me. I need, I need to do a version. I need to schedule a version. So basically I found a doctor that took our insurance that it was actually a practice at my hospital that I worked with because that's the only insurance that I had. It was HMO. I could only give birth at our hospital, which I infuriates me. Um, the home birth we paid for out of pocket, it was $4,000 and we, we paid for it out of pocket and we didn't buy a crib. So that tells you our budget situation. I called all these doctors and I found a, a practice that would see me right away because they knew me as a nurse. Um, good, that's a good thing and a bad thing, by the way. They accepted me as their patient 
two days later, I scheduled a version. And of course, the doctor that interviewed me to accept me as a patient, she said, um, I'm not really sure that this is going to work out for you and let's schedule a C-section. So she put me down on the book for a C-section. But luckily, the day of my version, she was not the doctor. It was this other woman who I also knew and worked with who was the perfect doctor to perform a version because she was a badass and she was tough and she didn't give a shit and she was not scared of anything and it was her and it happened to be a perinatologist also was in there and so for my version I got admitted to the hospital I got an IV I got terbutaline, which is a medicine that relaxes the uterus. And I got fentanyl, which is an opioid. (laughs) And I got the fentanyl. I was like, yes, give me the fentanyl. They said, do you want an epidural right away? That might help you relax. And I said, I will do that if I have to. But right now, let's start with the fentanyl. So they gave me um, the fentanyl and the terbutaline. And they got the ultrasound machine out. And it was in a normal L&D room, like a room where the babies are born. And my, my friend, um, Anne, she was my nurse and she grabbed my little hand and they put all of this like oil or goo or something on my belly, these two doctors, and they massaged my belly from the outside, but it was pretty rough. It was pretty rough. They massaged it from the outside and they, they manipulated this baby inside of my belly and turned her and dug deep inside and turned her so that she was head down. It was really short. It was only a minute and a half. And I I credit that also to the fact that I had gone in a bunch of acupuncture before then. And I think during the session, she would move, the top of her head would move kind of sideways during the session. And they ended up moving her in that same direction. I believe it was counterclockwise. So she kind of already knew which way to go, thanks to the acupuncture, I think. So she turned, and everything went well. She looked beautiful on the monitor. Um, They gave me this belly thing to put on, this binder to kind of shove her down so that she would stay down there. They told me to stay and have an induction, and I just said, no, thank you. Oh, is that typical to like immediately have the woman go into labor so the baby doesn't turn again? Oh, that's it often what they recommend. Okay. And this this kind of practice of doctors, they're pretty conservative. Like they really don't actually read very many studies like regularly. This kind of practice, it would take five to 10 years before they adopt a new research finding which is different than other doctors, like the doctors I work with today, you can bring them a study and then they'll do that same thing that the study found like this week, if that's what you ask them to do, you know, but this was not that kind of practice. So yeah, they were, they're they're like, we encourage you to come and stay and be induced. Otherwise she'll probably turn back around. And I just said, no, thank you. And then I, um, we left and that night we hiked, up these mountains. I mean, we were in San Diego, so we just went up and down the hills, up and down the hills for like five miles to get her wedged way down there so that she wouldn't move. So the version worked for us. And then two weeks later, because I was 38 weeks, two weeks later, I went into labor at home on my due date. I feel like the version was such a big part of our birth story because it allowed me to surrender my worst fears, which were that I would have to have a very medical birth and that it wouldn't, the birth itself, instead of giving me the strengths that I needed to move forward and be a mother, that the birth would actually hinder me in some way, like in further put me in a place where I was vulnerable and depleted. And this was my belief at the time. That's just what I believed. So the fact that, you know, I had processed all that out and moved through it. And the version was like the most healing experience for me, you know, because I really learned how to use my voice to ask for what I wanted and nothing more to say no to what I didn't want. Um, So that was beautiful. That was really, that was a defining moment. So I feel like I had done the psychological work before labor started. So I was just, when my labor started, it was just like gangbusters. It was just like, 
I, my water, <laughs> my water broke at like 5 PM and I was just like, ah, whatever. I'm like the midwives at that point. I was like, I really, they're really nice folks, but like, I don't really need them because they have no understanding of like whether or not my baby is head down or head up or whatever, but I like, couldn't like fire them at that point. So, but it was good because I was like, um, I learned that it was me. I was the one that was going to do it. It wasn't this mythical, like healing midwife that would save me from the experience of birth or like make it perfect or beautiful or meaningful or whatever. It was me. I was going to do it. So I went into labor at 5 PM. Um, and she was born, she was born exactly 12 hours, almost 12 hours to the minute. I mean, she's born at 5 50 AM. I broke my water first which as an L and D nurse, like that's your worst fear is that you break your water and you're not in labor and then they need to give you Pitocin and then you're going to have a C-section, you know, which is none of that's true, by the way, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, but that was like my, another fear I had. So I broke my water, but I was just like, whatever, I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen. (laughs) So I didn't call my midwives or anything when my water broke. I, I denied it. I ignored it. And my husband and I, which is like, as an L&D nurse, you never, you tell people, if you break your water, you have to come right away, you know? But I was just like, I was just disobedient. I was a disobedient patient for sure. I didn't even care at that point. I was like, I was, be, I was going radical <laughs> at that point. So, um, water broke. We went to Home Depot. We got stuff for the tub to fill up the tub because we, I was superstitious. I was like, if I get everything ready, I'm not going to have a home birth. Like something, it's going to be like this Murphy's Law where if I get all the stuff ready, then somehow the home birth is not going to happen. So we didn't have anything ready. Um, We didn't have the pool inflated. We didn't have the faucet adapters. We didn't have anything. So early labor, I went to Home Depot. I was leaking water. I think my husband got into a fight with the dude or I don't know. But um, I was just waddling down the Home Depot aisles like just being really grumpy because I was having cramps and I was just, I don't know. I was just like, why isn't this ready? And then we went home and that was my favorite part of the labor was early labor at home, drinking tea. My husband put up Christmas lights and we were slow dancing and the contractions were, I was like, oh, I can do this. I, I'm really strong. This is real and I can do this. Um, and then we went for a walk and we walked to the beach and that's where um, things really picked up. And the contractions went from like being something that I was noticing and kind of like coping with in air quotes to like bringing me to my knees. And I, as a doula, I've, I've walked people upstairs. I've like, when they're ready to push, I force them to like do crazy squats and to like, I'm like, you can do this. What are you talking about? Don't complain. (laughs) I mean, I don't, I didn't tell them not to complain, but I was like, you can do this. You're so tough. And their baby's coming out and they're walking down the stairs. But for me, when I was in, like, my first experience with real strong labor contractions, I was like, I can't move. I'm just going to lay here. Can you carry me back? And I just laid down in the sand, and it was, like, the grossest sand because it was, like, the dog beach sand. And I didn't care. I was like, you're going to just have to take me back. And I was a horrible laboring woman. I was, like, the worst. I was not the zen goddess like moaning and low ohms or like you know dancing with her surges or whatever I was complaining and whining and I felt incapacitated and I was like where is this religious experience that I'm supposed to be having right now I was just pissed and I looked in the mirror and I was just like god ugh. I hate this. I hate it. I'm trapped in my body and I hate it. I hate it. And I was just screaming my head off. And I had planned on waiting to call the midwives for a really long time. Like I wanted to call them like when the baby was coming out, just because at that point I, I just really trusted myself and I just didn't want any intervention at all. Like I didn't even want, you know, someone to say something like to say something that was annoying or anything. So So we waited a long time, but then as I was like 
having these crazy raging contractions and I was in the bathroom and I was screaming and it felt like my body was like ripping apart. I was like, Mike, I'm dying. Like they need to come and give me an IV or something. There's something wrong with me. There's something's not right. And so I heard my husband go out and call my mom for some reason. And I heard them talking and then I heard him call the midwives. Um, and then they got there and it was like three o'clock in the morning, maybe when they arrived and they came in and immediately I was like, Oh gosh, I don't know why we called them. It just, it's, it hit me that like, as soon as they got there, I was like, expected them to relieve my pain or to make me feel better. And I was just like, no, they're just here. They're just here. They're not, they can't get me through this any faster. Um, and they kind of were doing these weird things. Like they were turning on all the lights and they were like yelling at my husband because they went into the refrigerator and there wasn't any food in there for me. And, um, they were like, why isn't the tub filled up? Why isn't the tub put together? And I was like, ah, and my husband was like trying to get the tub going. For some reason, they wouldn't let me get into my bathtub because they, I don't know why. They're like, we can't deliver the baby in the bathtub. And it didn't make any sense to me. I was just like, don't babies just come out? <laughs> I was like, why? It was so arbitrary. Like, like I've, I've delivered a baby in a bathtub and I'm not even qualified. Um, but yeah, they didn't want me to get into the tub. So my husband, he finally filled up the tub and it was just like six inches of water. And after that, like the hot water tank like ran out. It was just like six, six little tiny inches of water it was not full how it was supposed to be at all. But I remember I got in the tub and by then they had checked me twice. They checked me when they got there. I was eight centimeters. And then they checked me to make sure air quotes that I was fully dilated that I could push, um, which I knew I was ready to push. I knew it. I just knew like when you're fully dilated and pushing like without, without direction and your body just takes over, it's, you know, that there's a baby coming out. So finally they would let me get into the tub and I got into the tub. And as soon as I got into the tub, I literally, it was like one of the best moments of my life, second or third, only to like my wedding day, and like the actual moment that my daughter was born. Number three was getting into the tub. It was it was like the best, most wonderful, safe feeling that I've ever felt to get into the water. And I think it was because there was like a barrier between me and everybody else. And I was just in my little space and it was a sacred space. And I could just do what I need to do and like no one could mess with me. And it relieved all of the scary, like sharp sensations I was feeling like in my butt. And it just made me feel really powerful. So that was so good. It was the, the best. And the, as soon as I got into the tub, I was like, I'm going to push this baby out. And I knew it. And I knew I didn't need anyone else's help. And I could just do it. And I remember I said something really mean to one of the midwives. She was like, oh, hey, this is how you're going to push. And I said... I believe I'm the one pushing this baby out. I will do it how I want. <laughs> and I love that. I love that I said that. So yeah, I was pushing and I, when I pushed, I could put my hand down like near my bottom and I could feel like I just put my hand right inside and I could feel her head move. And it was the best feeling ever. I, it was so good. And then, um, I just knew I was going to have her. And then I, this things get a little bit cloudy in my head at this point. I think she was crowning. They listened to her heartbeat. Her heartbeat was going slow because she was coming out and they were like, okay, you have to push this baby out right now. You have to get out of the tub. You have to stand up and get out of the tub. We have to, you have to push this baby out. And I was just like, I knew she was okay. Like I knew that she was fine. I knew I was going to push her out and I knew she was fine. And I didn't understand why they, there was this hurry that they felt, but I was just like, whatever, I just have to deal with these people. <laughs> so, so I did what they said. I stood up, I swung and her head was halfway out. I think I swung one leg over. I swung another leg over and then they pulled like one of the midwives pulled on her head really hard to get her to come out. And I was just like, 
I just wanted her to get, get away from me, but I was just like, you know what? You just gotta, you just gotta do it. Just get behind it and just do it. Just do it. So I just pushed her out as hard as I could. And then she was out. It was interesting because she came out and I looked at her and the first thing that I thought when I looked at her was, Ooh, she is ugly. We've got to do something about that. <laughs> I was like, I did not feel a surge of love towards her. I looked at her. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I was like, something. We have to do something. I mean, just, it doesn't even make sense. But I was like holding her. And the biggest relief was just that I was done. And I didn't feel love right away for her at all. And I think that that's important for people to know because you don't always feel in love with your baby right away. And I had had this physiologic birth, you know, without a Tylenol. And I did not feel that crazy surge, orgasmic love for my baby right when I met her. She felt like a stranger. She felt like someone I had to get to know before I could love. So that was really interesting. That was really interesting. That's super interesting, especially with your first baby. Like I hear that a lot with few like subsequent children because like you're, you know, you're like, can I open my heart to another <laughs> child? Yeah. And I had that with my son a little bit. I remember thinking he doesn't look anything like Mm-mm. Adelaide, my daughter. Like he doesn't look Mm-mm. like me. I don't know. He, just, he looked like a little stranger <laughs> to me. Yeah. Um, but I think with her, I just didn't know what to expect. So I, that thought didn't cross my mind. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was, I completely expected to fall in love right away because I've seen so many women have home births and almost all of them, they like cry and they're like, my baby. And I was just like, oh, she ugly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But I did fall in love with her. I fell in love with her like two or three days later. Um, I remember the moment I was like, we had given her a bath and she smelled like honey. It was the weirdest thing. I'd never smelled that smell before. And I asked my husband if he could smell it and he couldn't, he couldn't smell what I smelled, but I just, she was just delicious. And I was like, Oh, I love her. And I realized I loved her. It was really amazing. And after that, it was like, oh gosh, it was like a really hard, it was like your first love where you are so overwhelmed by the love that you kind of can't function. (laughs) And you're kind of like, oh, I just like, I just want this to kind of calm down a little bit because I can't even think clearly. It's too much. So the first week after she was born, um, I was in a, on this cloud in heaven My mom came and she cooked for us and cleaned for us. And I felt so strong and she, my daughter was breastfeeding really well and she was doing great. And I had the home birth and I was like, after that, I was like, I don't care. And my new mantra for life became fuck what they think. And it's never changed. It's always been that ever since. So that was amazing. And, and I got everything out of the birth that I needed Let's talk about your kind of postpartum experience after that initial week and how you felt, you know, emotionally and physically. I feel like the good feelings um, continued for a couple weeks, but then I think it was maybe two or three weeks after the birth, my daughter started getting really colicky and she would cry a lot and she would need to be held all of the time. And I think that around that time I was starting to like two or three weeks in, I was starting to think about having to go back to work and being the breadwinner and worried about finances. I had really never had a really close girlfriend give birth. I was like the first person in my group of friends that gave birth. And so I had never really seen like a post one week, two week, three week postpartum body And I remember one day I looked in the mirror and I just looked at myself and I was like, oh my gosh, like, I just felt like so foreign to myself. 
And I felt so smushy and soft and not of myself. And I just didn't know what a postpartum body looked like. And I didn't ever know if I would be um, normal again, if I would ever bounce back or whatever. And so that was one piece of the puzzle. And then the fact that she cried, I assumed if I have a baby that cries that much, it must be because I'm not a good mom. Like that's, that's what I thought in my head. It was like, if our baby cries as much, it's because I'm not a good mom. It's because she knows that I'm not ready to be her mom. And I think it's really important for me to say, say that because I think a lot of women think that. But the truth is she was just a high needs baby. She was a needy little baby because she's really smart. She hated being in her body. She hated being out of control as a newborn. And that's who she was. She's still like amazing, incredible, smart um, curious, brave, fearless child, but she's just very, she just needs a lot. Like she's just, she just requires everyone's attention around her. Like she is, that's who she is. And that's how she was made. She came out like that. And then I just felt very helpless. And I felt, I felt, I didn't have community around me. And that's the biggest thing. I didn't have other women who believed what I believed about mothering, who wanted to mother the way I wanted to mother. Like all of my friends had sleep schedules and they were trying to aim to get their three month olds to sleep through the night. All of the other mothers were putting their babies in separate rooms from them. And I, I'm telling you right now, I don't care what anyone else does, but I didn't have a single other person that I could talk to that wanted, that felt the same way that I did about mothering and who didn't want to put her baby in a separate room and who wanted to listen to her baby. And I wanted to breastfeed and I wanted to, you know, honor our relationship as best as I could. And I, and I had to go back to work really soon. I had to go back to work at six or seven weeks postpartum. And that was really, really, really hard. And I can't even imagine people that have to go back at like three weeks postpartum because that happens. It really does. I had a La Leche League book that I was reading because that was like my support was a La Leche League book that I got at a garage sale was my like that was the only information I was getting from anybody. And then this book was just like, they were framing moms that go back to work. They were like, it's, that's just not ideal. That's just not, you know, what, what is best for the baby or for you. And so I just felt this tremendous amount of guilt going back to work and leaving my baby all night to go to work. And so I was just like obsessed with breastfeeding and obsessed with pumping and making sure I had enough milk. And I struggled with that. I struggled with pumping enough. And I remembered like if ever milk went bad or if ever milk spilled or anything, I, it just felt like the end of the world because I felt like if I didn't breastfeed that I was, I would lose this connection that I was so precarious to begin with because I had to go back to work and all of these things, none of that is true. Like none of it is as precarious as it seems. And if I had had other mommies around me to be like, you're doing good, you can still breastfeed. You can even formula feed a little bit and still breastfeed. You can even, you know, let someone else watch your baby for two hours and you can go, go for a walk or something. Like I just needed that support and I didn't have it. So everything felt so precarious and I had so much anxiety about everything and um, I remember four weeks out, I was trying to go for a run and my body just did not, would not. Um, and I remembered I walked all the way to this bridge and I looked down into the water and I was like, I just want to jump in. I just want to jump in and I just want to disappear. And, and then I just started sobbing because I couldn't believe that I, that I was responsible for another person and that in doing that, I could never really ever disappear again, <laughs> ever have the, just the opportunity to disappear or self-destruct again. And I was pissed. I was really sad. I hated myself for thinking these thoughts. And then I was pissed that, that I had lost the opportunity to disappear. Um, so that was my experience. That was like the lowest point. And it took me a long time to get better. I wish that I had had 
someone just say like, it's not all or nothing. It's not like, oh, you're a hippie person and you don't take any medication or, oh, you're a, you're like not a hippie and you take all of the medication and you don't trust yourself. You don't trust your instincts and you are divorced from your whatever. You know what I mean? Like I wish someone would have said, you can take Zoloft and feel better and be okay and get better. And then you don't have to worry about you know, these crazy thoughts that you have all the time and you can get better and then maybe come off it and maybe you can do other things to make you feel better. In the meantime, it's a rescue measure. It's, it's for your well being. You don't have to suffer like this. I just, so that's what I try to give to other women. I try to, there's nothing that's off the table. Like we can talk about herbs. We can talk about yoga. We can talk about mindfulness. We can talk about Zoloft. We can talk about like telling your mother-in-law to fuck off. We can do all of that. Like it's all on the table. There's nothing off the table. Cause like the only thing that matters is that you're okay. I love that. Well, speaking of kind of all those different options, um, as we're kind of wrapping up, did you have any specific resources that you wanted to share with listeners? The best source online for everything that I'm working on and doing is my Instagram page. The women that I speak to, the women whose births I attend, um, my postpartum work that I do for people, um, my birth work that I do, my training that I do for nurses, it's all, I all refer to everything on my Instagram. And I also try to connect people that are like-minded people and to kind of highlight um, women's stories because women's stories are so important. They're more important than anything else, honestly. And like for so long, I think we're, we are like ashamed or we are like, oh, I don't want to draw attention to myself. I don't want to talk about something that I'm kind of awkward about. And I, to me, it's like truth is medicine and telling our stories. My favorite thing that I always repeat to myself and that I share with others is as long as we have our stories, there is hope. And, um, so that's, that's what I do. I'm here. I'm here for you. Um, and people tell me stories. They send me messages. They tell me their birth trauma. They tell me their birth stories. They tell me things that they love about being a mom and they tell the truth about what's really hard about it. And I love all of it. I love every little bit of it. It's juicy and it's good. And that's what we need. That's what we need. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kate, for coming on the birth hour today. Thank you so much for having me. Now I'm going to chat with Ashley from Motif Medical about the new Aura wearable breast pump. Hi, Ashley. Welcome back to the birth hour. Thank you so much for being here today. Bren, it's great to be back. I'm so excited and thank you for having us on. Of course. I'm excited to have you back on to talk about the new Motif Aura. Um, Before we get to that, can you tell listeners just a little bit about you and what you do? Of course. I'm a lactation consultant in IBCLC, and I have gone from doing home consultations and um, hospital visits and working in community service, like with WIC programs and things, to uh, really diving into going behind the scenes and working on helping businesses like Motif Medical come up with great products and really listening to moms and what their needs are and kind of bridging that gap between um, the consumer and moms and providing education and working hand in hand with a company like Motif. Awesome. So we've talked in the past about the Motif Luna breast pump, which I'm a huge fan of. And I, you know, listeners hear me talk about it all the time because I've tried so many pumps having had three kids and working in this industry. Um, And it's by far been my favorite, but the Motif Aura is very different. So um, I want to hear about that and kind of how it came about and what's special about it. Of course. I'm really, really excited to talk about the aura because it was definitely on the the need list, you know, something to really round out what we can offer to moms. And it is our purely hands-free down to being able to control the settings with an app, a hands-free model um, that can still stand up to the strength settings that we see in the Luna. So we're able to bridge the needs of a mom needing to sit down with a desktop model such as the Luna, but be able to maybe switch things up and use something that's a lot more mobile and be able to keep up and use. So you have multiple children. So being able to still pump and go about your day to day and feel like you can incorporate your pumping goals with your, your lifestyle and not have to give time up for that. 
Right. So it would be considered a wearable breast pump, right? Definitely wearable, completely hands-free. Okay. So how does it work with the app and the way the pumping works that makes it just as strong as the Luna? So with to, to not necessarily be an engineer and know exactly how they were <laughs> able to manage that, um, they were able to keep the sound, the decimals uh, quiet like the Luna, the strength settings like the Luna, and they are, are measuring exactly in line with that. And it also serves to keep it in place. So they have to have a, a stronger strength setting really to keep these truly uh, wearable with a good nursing bra is my recommendation. But you're able to manually adjust settings uh, with a digital setting on top. So you're able to see it from your perspective as you wear them, what settings that you're currently on. But with a free app, you're able to connect your pump. It remembers what settings that you used and for how long you pumped. And you're able to adjust the settings on the app with just a few clicks of a button to the setting that you're wanting while your pump is actively in use. And does it hold as much milk as a regular pump? Um, It depends on what pump you're used to. This holds up to four ounces. Um, The Luna you know, we can, we can use bottles that hold, you know, six and eight ounces, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of adaptations there. So there is going to be some differences that I think it's important for moms to be aware of when selecting this kind of pump. As an LC, I have to say it should not replace a desktop pump if you're a full-time pumper or heavily reliant as a part-time pumper. But this is a great pump for on the go, traveling, maybe you're getting things done around the house, maybe getting some work done. I know a lot of moms are back in the workplace, um, you know, maybe not necessarily working from home anymore. Um, So being able to continue on with their routine and still be able to get a pumping session in. So if you have a healthier supply, let's say, maybe you get more than four ounces per session per side, this may be something that's not on your radar uh, because it only holds up to four ounces. However, if you're doing the typical, what's on average, three and a half, four ounces per side per session, um, this is perfect. It's it's basically to catch an exact feeding on average. Right. Okay. Yeah. I noticed on the website too, that the recommendation there was using it as a secondary on the go option. So what's, especially as a lactation consultant, what's kind of the reasoning there with having a desktop pump like the Luna, and then this is a secondary option. So the the desktop Luna is going to be designed for higher volume needs. So if you're part-time or above pumping, so if you're pumping at least half of your uh, sessions or even pumping full time. And especially if you're pumping for multiples, you need something that's going to have not only the strength settings, but the volume capacity to withstand those those demands. That's a very demanding thing to put on a machine um, for for that amount of time spent. Um, Both are rechargeable, so it's not necessarily about battery operations and being able to hold charge. They each have anywhere between four and six hour charge of continuous pumping, but it's more of volume needs. So it is absolutely, the Aura is absolutely meant to be a complementary type of pumping mechanism or for the ones who just want something for the occasion in which they might need to pump. Maybe they're traveling. Maybe they are just needing to pump for the occasional, I have a doctor's appointment or a date night or a girl's night out, you know, something that's going to have temporary separation from baby. Maybe you typically feed directly from the breast and hardly ever have the need to pump. This is a great kind of um, complimentary pump to have on hand that's going to get the job done. Um, But it's not something that I would want a mom to rely solely on. Okay. And I noticed that there's different um, sizes, different silicone inserts, which I assume is kind of like a flange. And I would love to hear about that. And also just kind of the feedback you've been getting as far as comfort using the Aura. So this is something I'm particularly excited about. It's not something that I've seen um, across the board with other wearable brands. Mm -hmm. And that is the variety of sizes and inserts. Sizes are important, you know, because we are certainly not a one size fits all uh, type of situation. So the flange itself that is built into the mechanism is a size 29 millimeter, which is a little bit above average for the the average size that I see. Um, So we have these really nice, comfortable silicone inserts so that if you do find yourself falling smaller than that 29 millimeter. And we can even talk about how to size properly for that too. But with the model that they send out, they will send 
three different size silicone inserts from 21 millimeter, 24 millimeter, and 28 millimeter. Uh, but however, we just found out that we are getting, I believe it's 15, 17, and 19 millimeter as well. So there's going to be a huge variety of sizes uh, that will make this work for many, many moms. And that's, that just makes my day. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, choosing sizes. I know it's it's becoming a very um, more talked about and can actually be a really complicated thing. So I don't know how, how in depth we can get, but any tips you can get as far as, you know, when someone's first trying it out. Absolutely. And and this goes with any pump, but especially yeah. a wearable pump. You have to make sure that it's going to not only stay in place, um, but you want it to be comfortable. And then, of course, we want it to be effective. If it's not doing its job, it's a waste of time. So it's just like a good latch. We want to make sure that the fit of your flange is good. And, you know, any kind of discomfort is going to make you a little less receptive to responding to your pump too. So the 29 millimeter plastic uh, flange that's built into the mechanism is is comfortable. It's concave. The tunnel is not really long, um, but it's very, it's meant to be up close and personal with you. It's pressed against you firmly so that it does not um, slip or Uh, become off center. And then the silicone inserts make it just a seamless uh, sizing fixture if you need to size down at all. Um, And as far as sizing for your flange, we have different measurement tools that you can find online. But honestly, um, if you have a tape measure at home, I like to use the ones that, you know, we sew with, you know, the ones that are meant for uh, being able to bend around, not necessarily one of those uh, metallic, very rigid type of <laughs> measuring uh, tapes, uh, but something softer and you can measure the diameter of your nipple. And I'm not going to include the size of your areola, the area around the nipple. We're going to measure in millimeters the entire diameter of the nipple and add four, and that's your size. Um, If you're kind of in between that, you can play around with a size up or a size down and see what's most comfortable for you. Um, But yes, it is the most talked about, it is the highest searched thing that we've seen on our end for flange fitting, flange sizing, how to know your flange size. Like it is the most searched topic. Um, and I think it is the number one troubleshooting thing that I look for when we're talking specifically about pumping and maybe not getting the output we're looking for. The first thing we do is see, do you have the right size? Amazing. I I hadn't heard that actual measurement technique yet. So that's great. Um, And I'm excited to hear that this is has different options because I tried a wearable, you know, when they were first coming out four years ago, and it had me in tears, it was not comfortable, it did not get the milk out. um, So I haven't been able to recommend it. But um, I'm glad that things are still evolving because it shouldn't be that complicated, right? Um, We should be able to have new things coming in this area. So I love that Motif is always listening to the customer and developing new things. And so with those new flange sizes, you're essentially going to have like, what, seven different options, which is amazing. Exactly. Seven is not something I've really seen anywhere else. And it's really important for me to, to be able to recommend when, when, when a mom tells me I'm using this model or that model and I just can't find the right size. So we're now we're having to outsource, um, inserts, you know, and there's different brands that are wonderful out there for providing those, but it's one more expense. It's one more thing to have to wait on to get shipped to you. It's really great to have this, um, just automatically have sizes to choose from. And then if you still don't have your size, have something in-house to, to select from. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on to talk with me. I've been seeing the aura on, uh, social media and of course on motifmedical.com, but I really wanted to talk to you so that I could get all the details. So thank you so much for your time today. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited to get to share and, and be able to catch up with you too and, and, and get to talk about something that's so new and exciting. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.